The clock struck 5am and there I was, sitting along on my bed, suddenly woken, not by my alarm, not by a strange noise, but by a sudden haunch. A haunch to do what exactly? I asked myself. My mind felt blank for a few moments. Then it began in a flash, a sudden influx of random and odd thoughts. Hold on. Is this... Is this it again? The usual panic attack. A panic attack at 5 a.m.? It decided to come at 5 a.m. Who exactly have I wronged? What did I do? Where are they? I am willing to pay them off. For the first time in 15 years, I began to shed tears. The last time I cried was at the funeral of a very good friend. I wept bitterly because I was tired. I was tired of the panic attacks, tired of the fact I have to live this way but I gracefully walked the office floors in authority and strength like I owned the world. I did own part of the business. It grew worse. The uncertainty, the frequent gasps for air, the restlessness, home, home. I want to go home. I yelled to myself as I scattered my beddings and clenching my feet deep into my pillow, home home. I thought, as I restlessly grabbed my phone, logging into my travel app, and booked the next flight available to Lagos. As I completed this act, I began to feel a sudden ease, a tiny wave of chilled breeze on my feet, until it spread into my legs, then finally my upper body, cold, cold, I am cold. I screamed. I screamed as I leapt up out of my roughened bed into the shower. As the thought of warm water on my supposedly cold body began to calm me down, just then did I realize the extent of what I'd just done. Looking at myself in the mirror, thinking of my actions, only did it just sink in that I was homesick and was truly going home. I can't turn back now. I've booked the flights. Should I call the office? No. No. My Instagram post will update them about my whereabouts. I'm going home and I don't need to ask, apologize for or beg for it. One would expect me to feel elated about the journey, but I felt mixed feelings. It has all changed the people, the surroundings, the place. From what I hear, home is now hostile unwelcoming and not a home. I slowly packed a duffel bag and a small luggage, filled them with new white t-shirts, a few five pair of blue shorts, a pair of boat shoes, a pair of Nikes, my wash bag, a camera, Teju Ko's known and strange things, one checkbook, one bank card and a mosquito net I had purchased from a roadside vendor while roaming around Brixton a few years ago. Yes, I kept it. I knew this day would come. I turned off my work phones, removed the SIM cards and neatly placed them on my bed. Cab, please. I gently spoke into my auxiliary mobile phone. Where to? The man at the other end of the receiver asked. Heathrow, I replied. That will be 65 pounds. Yes, fine. Send a driver. As I sat on one of the chairs in my living room, expecting the driver, like an athlete, I began to prepare myself mentally for the journey. Is this even necessary? I mean, this is supposed to be a joyful trip, right? Where you get to see some relatives and all sorts? I asked myself. I focused my attention to the background music, Homowo by Basa Basa, which I had intentionally put on repeat while packing to get me in the mood whatever the mood meant. Pondering on the lyrics of the song, I thought to myself, how did you get here? Interrupted by the cab driver's phone call, I hurled the duffel bag across my back, lifted the suitcase and gave the living room one last look to ensure everything was in its right place. Ileya, home time. 
I said to myself and walked out of the house with my unbranded sunglasses on at 7.23 a.m. It was my fifth day back to my roots, Ondo State, Nigeria, an escape from grey skies, monotony and the dismal British weather, to blue skies, palm fronds, gentle calm breezes, beautiful sunset and nature's rhythmic sounds. I have not been home in 25 years and it was having a massive effect on me physically, spiritually and psychologically. As I took a stroll back to my hut, which was adjacent to my cousins, I began to ponder if the journey back to my village was either futile or a premeditated act by unknown supernatural forces that may be at play. What makes a grown man get up at 5am on a Monday morning and thoughtlessly book a flight from London to Nigeria, or because of a sudden haunch to come home? Travelling from coziness and comfort to lay in a cocoon of darkness and mosquitoes is not what an individual in his or her right mind would do. Although, I was happy that I avoided the rush hour madness that London has to offer on a Monday morning. A break from coffee, black cabs, tailored suits, serious hegemonic faces and fast paces, I considered that moment in time to be a luxury. The soothing and alluring aroma of pounded yam, vegetable soup mixed with prawns, crayfish, bushmeat beef and stockfish interrupted my train of thought. The sight and smell of this palatable dish replaced my pondering with nostalgic memories from my childhood. It redirected my steps from my hut towards the large open space where some beautiful women dressed in colourful aso oke gracefully wielding the odo and dished the food like goddesses of an ancient times as told by myth. This act was simultaneously accompanied by some sort of singing similar to Negro spirituals. As they sang, they made rhythms and beats with their wooden serving spoons and calabashes, creating sounds and music that seemed to tell stories of their lives past, experiences and aspirations. It was 6 p.m. The sun had begun to set, and it shone brightly on their sweaty dark skins revealing its aesthetic texture and glory. The scene was a phenomenal sight to behold, an integration of ancient music, art and craft. It would have probably made God smile. As night time began to draw near, the darkness grew stronger. The men began to pile up woods and sticks in front of a large hut in preparation for a campfire. The kids set up tree stumps in circular formations and placed feathers and animal skins on them for sitting comfort. The actions unfolding before my eyes were bizarre and unnatural. I glanced at my watch. It was 8pm African time. By now, I would have probably been tucked into bed in my penthouse in London, sleeping off the stress and weariness of the stock exchange. My cousin, Bami. An Oxford graduate who visited home frequently was accustomed to the lifestyle and culture. She noticed my anxiety and uneasiness. Staring at the contraption of yours won't make a difference. Here we tell time by seasons and constellations, she remarked. Gazing at her oval face and thin lips in awe as they moved, I began to wonder if the construct of her statement was due to logic or dementia. Who calls a Rolex a contraption, I thought. Tell him, auntie, Bami continued, alluding to a woman opposite me, whom I assumed is a distant relative. I had not noticed her present until now. I bowed my head and muttered the vague words, yes ma, in respect. Although that was not the appropriate form of salutation, she responded with a smile knowing I was long lost family. I was supposed to prostrate fully with both hands on the floor and remain static in that position until I was told to get up. Aunt Koye led Bami and I towards the large space in front of the hut. The fire had been lit. It began to burn brightly and intensely. It was so bright that it seemed to mysteriously change the atmosphere of open space we were in. It created beautiful colour schemes of orange, blue, black and yellow. Everyone's face was recognisable. 
Their patterned traditional attire glowed exquisitely and blended perfectly well with the environment. The calm breeze, tweeting birds, creaking trees and the water from the nearby stream delivered captivating sounds. It would have made one assume that the whole setting was prepared in expectation of a divine visitor. The decorated calabashes and gourds in which food and palm wine were served shone brightly as if they had been excellently polished by a professional concierge. The warmth from the fire had begun to engulf my body and soul. A smile emerged from the left side of my face and I felt euphoria and peace. As we took our seats with other members of our family, few members of my clan and other strangers from the community to commence the feast, silence began to set in until it were totally silent. No cries, no hums, no movement. The quietness and stillness aroused my curiosity. All that could be heard were the cracks from fire and nature's sounds. Suddenly, I noticed all heads turned towards the hut and I turned too. The door of the hut opened slowly and gently, and to my amazement, a very old man whom I had no idea lived among us till now emerged from the hut, accompanied by two other men to aid his balance. As he steadily and carefully approached us barefooted, his vague image began to become vivid. He wore a turban made of cowries and a patterned fabric, a full body length white tunic and a white shroud made of sheepskin. His accessories included arm and neck beads in various shades of brown. A well decorated staff covered in cowries and designed with mysterious cosmic patterns and symbols which gave him authority and support. He seemed very fragile but appeared to be a walking library full of ancient wisdom and knowledge. As he took his seat he gave a deep sigh of comfort and relaxation. He sat like a god. His eyes travelled across the crowd and aimed straight for my face. Establishing eye contact, he gave a faint smile and beckoned to Bami and I to come and sit in front of him. I was gripped with fear and anxiety as a million pessimistic thoughts run through my head. E kareomomi. Well done my children, he said. After uttering few words in form of prayers, he ordered the commencement of the feast. The peaceful environment once again regained life, and the whining and dining began with the sound of chewing of various kinds, some decent, others inappropriately loud and unbothered. As I allowed the mouth-watering dishes and delicacies to satisfy my hunger, engulf my mind and soul, the corner of my eyes could not refrain from scrutinizing the old man and his body movement. He noticed my observations and again gave a faint smile. After about an hour of dining, both men who had accompanied the old man out of the hut earlier picked up two weird looking drums which seemed to have legs from behind a large tree and began to beat them rhythmically. They beat the drums so beautifully and powerfully that the resonance and melodies from the drum beats seemed to communicate with my soul. It seemed to call to my purpose and brought me messages and reasons for my impromptu trip. Your mother instructed to have the drums played and melodies played when she brought you here as a child, whispered Aunt Koye. My jaw dropped in shock and astonishment. Immediately, I realized that moment Aunt Koye talked about had been deeply embedded in my subconscious self, which explains reasons as to why I have an odd crave to be a percussionist and why my soul rises to an unexplainable dimension of bliss and ecstasy when I hear drum beats on the busy and buzzy streets of London. As the drumming died down, the crowd began to assemble their seats close to the old man. Bami gave me a nudge and told me, It is time for some ancient wisdom and soul food. With a smile and a jovial tone, I responded, Why do you have to be so puzzling with your speech codes? Just say it is a story time or something. Ah, such acts are expected from a goddess, an Oxford graduate, Bami replied. I was impressed by her confidence and modesty. She appeared to be self-conscious, knowledgeable and wise. Perhaps she would make a good wife to Lanre, a good friend of mine, 
was a doctor and also owned his own practice in the city. Just then, the drumming began to fade out, signifying the next line of action. The old man slowly gulped down the remnants of the palm wine from his cowrie-covered calabash, cleared his throat and prepared himself for a speech. I leaned over to Bami and whispered in her ear, Who is this old man and where did he come from? She gave me a cold, reprimanding facial expression. A long hiss then replied, I will not call you a fool, but you are not wise. However, I do not blame you. His name, age, and background are unknown, but we call him Baba. Ah, I see. Finest guys are forever curious, you know. At least you spoke in plain English this time. Thank you. I responded with a smile. Baba laughed so hard it made me feel embarrassed and confused. I assume he overheard the dialogue between my cousin and I, and perhaps her response made him laugh in such manner. He cleared his throat once again and commented in a cheerful tone. It's alright, my children. Wisdom and knowledge are available to those who seek, but it is the duty of the seeker of both to abide by the discoveries of their quest. To whom much is given, much is expected. Therefore it began, a voyage into various dimensions of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, perception and depth. I clutched, wrapped a shroud around myself to induce warmth, buried my feet deep in the sand, clenched my right fist and placed it beneath my chin to act as support. I stared intensely at his face, seeking answers. I decided to get lost in a moment. He stamped his staff on the ground three times looked up towards the sky and uttered some sort of prayer or incantation, saying, To the all-seeing one who knows all, to the magnificent seated in indecipherable magnitudes of honour and glory, to the one who set boundaries to the land and seas, to the one who feeds the tiniest of insects and beautifies the lilies in the fields, to the one who defeats the wise with their own foolishness, Olodumare, in humility I bow in worship, Iba. As you have commanded the wind to transport words to its recipients, and the cock to crow at dawn to announce the birth of a new day to farmers and market women, in such inexplainable medium, you proclaimed the message of liberty to a long lost soul. I am nothing but dust. I am nothing but a vessel. Iba, Iba, Iba. As he spoke, I could not help but gaze at his lips in amazement, wondering where those short but enigmatic words emanated from. It would have taken years of training, self-discipline, mental and physical strength to master his art. A part of me wished I were him. Simultaneously, another part of me was pleased with my life as a banker. After his prayers, he paused for a second and began. On the coldest night of the year when the heaviest tempest known to man raged, the boy was born. He dropped out of his mother's womb crying and laughing. In the thick slimy fluid of blood, sweat, tears and water he lay. What a mystifying way to enter this cold world. As the years went by, he grew rapidly in height, knowledge and strength equivalent to that of a hundred men. No one matched him. Realizing his abilities, pride germinated within his soul. I am stronger than the strongest god. Death sees me and runs, he would proclaim. On the other side of the village was the forest of light, which intensely glowed at night due to unknown reasons. Inhabited by gomids and other grotesque supernatural beings, this forest is rumored to be where every rainbow ended and its curve and a portal to the dwelling of gods. However, some profess other myths. The boy randomly got up one afternoon, packed his bags and announced his departure to the forest of light. Amidst wailing and tears, his mother begged him to stay. With courage and pride, he said, I will go and return with the heads and riches of the gods. As he departed, he never looked back, and that was the last time he saw his village and mother. Arriving at the forest of light, a voyage that took him fifty days, he sat down to rest. Noticing a gomid who was going about its business, he approached it, grabbed it by its hair and shouted, I will kill you, eat you, and become a god. Where is the rest of your kind? 
The Gomed begged profusely for his life to be spared, but the boy listened not. As he hungrily and tastefully devoured the Gomed, a thousand Gomeds emerged from the shadow to retaliate in anger. The boy murdered half of them. The rest fled to report the strange occurrence to the other supernatural beings of the forest. Perplexed by the boy's act, they all in one accord reported him to the creature. The creature let out at his anger by blinding the boy. He felt no remorse and laughed at the creature, saying, Is this all your might? Furious, the creature caused a ferocious earthquake, storm and wind to ravage the hut in which the boy dwelt. Still, the boy felt no remorse. Immediately, the creature in all his might and strength caused the ground to open up and swallow the boy thus transporting him to another dimension of space and time. This inexpressible journey lasted for 200 years and was filled with unending torment, torture, pain, anguish, pestilence and gnashing of teeth. At the end of his journey, every ounce of his spirit, soul and body was shattered and crushed. The boy found himself sitting in a scorching desert broken, naked and stripped of his confidence and identity. All he wanted was water and a piece of fabric for his dirty, lacerating skin. Rocking back and forth on his numb buttocks, he kept uttering the word Maktoub. A dozen and two days passed. He was still sitting there in his weak state, still rocking. His experience paved way for humility to reside within the innermost parts of his spirit and soul. With seven minutes of life left in him, death stood by waiting to harvest his soul. He faintly uttered the word, ma ma and he delved into a mystifying mirage. He saw the past, the present, but the future was withheld from him. The words, you are an image of the creator, speak, echoed continuously in his enigmatic state. With the last ounce of his life and strength in him, the boy yelled, I surrender. The sentence echoed throughout the desert. The desert felt a distant energy, an energy that was present during the moment's creation. His weak spine straightened up, his eyes opened with strength, his dry tongue regained moisture and he began communicating with the forces of life and manipulating matter with the usage of celestial words and proverbial incantations. He conversed with the four elements and commanded them to do his wish. He sent them on individual tasks. The sun and moon came down to cloth him with their glory. Rulers and principalities of earth and other planets stared and marveled in awe at his magnificence. He humbly knelt down in prayer to the creator of the universe. Still in the act, the wind came and carried him away, far away from the desert. The boy sat there, on a mat, amongst presidents, kings, an aristocrat suggesting schemes and policies for docile minds and poor souls. He mostly spends his evening giving out soul food to those in need. One evening, he decided to take a stroll in the fields. A bright light flashed. There in the northern section of the sky it appeared a chariot of fire and a whirlwind which came to take him to the innermost part of the heavens. He humbly knelt down and thanked the creator of the universe for granting him a spot in his presence. In the beginning was the boy. The boy became a man, and the man became a god. As Baba concluded his tale, a cool breeze began to blow. The sky seemed they could burst open and at any moment releasing its blessings in heavy form of rain. I could not hold back the hot tears that formed in my eyes while the story was being told because I could relate with the protagonist in the story. The story touched the depth of my soul. In my early years, I was labeled a genius, a wild child, and described as an individual who would rise to influential positions of power and authority. Now 37, I hold one of the most prominent positions on the London Stock Exchange. However, the city life engulfed me. By ethical and unethical means, I became a chronic capitalist. I failed to find and understand my life's purpose. This gave greed, pride and vanity a foothold in my life. My moral compass was reprogrammed from purity to filth. I hosted and attended some of London's most influential parties in Knightsbridge. 
Chelsea and other luxurious party spots where drugs, alcohol and women had to be present in excess or the party was futile. A capitalist state of mind was all I had. I had lost the notion of self and masked my identity from society. A different self for a different occasion. God was a myth. Neither church nor priest existed in my vocabulary. I had it all. Countless Omega watches, tailored Savile Row suits, bespoke Oxford shoes, two penthouses, thriving investment portfolios, two trendy Bentleys and was negotiating for a deal on a yacht. However deep down within my soul, I was broken, wrecked and disconnected from the source of life. The rain had begun to pour down heavily. I had not noticed the absence of the crowd and the quenched fire because I was deep in thought and tears, still clutched, wrapped up and seated facing Baba. I began to rock back and forth and my cousin who stood there staring at me was mesmerized by my actions. For unknown reasons, unshaken by the storm, Baba was still sitting in the same spot with his escort staring at me, perhaps waiting for me to shed all the crocodile tears as my mom would describe it, or he was waiting for me to make a move. Nevertheless, I did notice his lips move, probably uttering prayers. My watch struck 12 a.m. and the storm got heavier. Still in my reflective and remorseful state, I suddenly leaped up and ran towards the river screaming, I surrender! I surrender! As I ran, I began to strip off my clothes, shoes and watch. I dived into the river butt naked with the aim to swim towards liberation. Uncontrollably tears rolled down my cheeks. I felt sorry for myself and those whom I had offended. Still in the river, in the raging storm, I raised my head towards the sky and began to confess my wrongful deeds. This lasted for about 45 minutes or more. In his feeble state, Baba walked to the bank of the river and stretched out his arms in a call of acceptance. Like a child running to receive a precious gift, I ran into his arms and gave him a tight hug. He said to me, Son, tonight you shall attain liberty and greater heights. He submerged me in the river and lifted me out, repeating this act seven times while uttering powerful prayers, which I could not recollect. I finally understood the reason for my sudden premonition for me to return home. Thus, I began my voyage of soul-searching, seeking my purpose, self-awareness and aligning myself with the infinite. All I can do is weep, weep and weep tears of joy and repentance.